All right, guys, let's start. Can you hear me in the back? Not very well. All right. Better? Okay, so... Oh, geez, that's loud. That's me. Okay, so uh, let's move on so, uh, and switch from our favorite enzymes to the uh, next topic, I mean, which will be carbohydrates. So in the, uh, in the, in the, se in the next several lectures, we will be talking about the different classes of uh, biological macromolecules, right? So, so basically, actually, the whole, uh, the whole uh, um, discipline biochemistry mainly studies, I mean, the molecules such as proteins, of course, I mean, that you already studied with Professor Jeffrey, carbohydrates or sugars, as we will uh, study today, and what are the other polymers? Those will be nucleic acids and, exactly. So how do you think which one out of these four major biopolymers is the most abundant on our planet? Huh? What? Exactly, why? Sugars, yeah, why? No, no, but carbon is a, it's also like, I mean, it's present everywhere, right? So it's in nucleic acids and lipids and in proteins. So it's all based on carbon. It's not because of that. So, so your answer is correct, but why? Yeah, but what is, uh, let's say, I mean, what I'm saying, like, in terms of mass, like in kilograms and pounds, right? So, so what, what is that I'm referring to, like, uh, that makes, I mean, this uh, uh, carbohydrates the most abundant biopolymer on, on the earth? Huh? No, weight-wise, I mean, it's negligible. And genetic material is nucleic acids, it's not sugars. You're actually very close to the correct answer, so. Uh, trees, like plants. So wood. Wood is cellulose, which we will uh, study today. So cellulose is made out of glucose, I mean, and glucose is sugar. So, and uh, by total net weight, I mean, so it's by far the most abundant uh, polymer. Again, this is chapter 7 in the Leninger Principles of Biochemistry. Uh, and the specific pages you can see in the, uh, like in the, in the materials uh, on the blackboard. Um, okay, so what are carbohydrates? So carbohydrates, I mean, the uh, chemical definition would be like polyhydroxyaldehydes or ketones or substrates that yield such compounds upon hydrolysis. Uh, so, yeah, this is a little complicated definition, but, I mean, it would be uh, much simpler to just simply say that uh, these are the chemical compounds which have empirical formula CH2O n times. So you see, uh, C stands for carbo, and H2O, that's water, carbohydrates. So, so basically, these are the molecules whose empirical formula can be written down as, as this. For example, glucose, it will be C6H12O6. So, so like as if I'm in one carbon and six water, uh, six carbons and six waters together. Uh, of course, I mean, some of the sugars contain uh, atoms other than just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and we will see what are those sugars. Uh, but what's important is that the sugars produced from uh, CO2 and, I mean, basically carbon dioxide and water uh, uh, in the process uh, of photosynthesis in plants. So, um, in terms of molecular weight, uh, sugars can actually range from uh, from be actually being very small, such as uh, glyceraldehyde, which is only 90 grams per mole, to uh, something as huge as amylopectin, which is uh, like more than uh, 200 million grams per mole. Okay, uh, so the, what are the functions of sugars or carbohydrates in living organisms? I mean, they're plenty. So as you said, uh, energy source or energy storage. Uh, but that's for the organism themselves. I mean, it's not for the other organism like human who uses uh, the trees as a source of fuel. So, so the sugars, I mean, themselves, I mean, are very useful. It's a very useful, uh, 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 basically, energy storage material. Uh, so they serve as structural components. So cell walls, especially in plants, uh, and also bacteria, and also uh, in arthropods. So the exoskeletons are made of ke uh, chitin, which is a polysaccharide. Uh, so, uh, sh I mean, uh, polysaccharides and oligosaccharides can also participate uh, uh, in, in various information exchange between the cells. Uh, and as we will see, the sugars can be linked to proteins and uh, uh, to form gl uh, glycoproteins or protoglycans and also to lipids. Okay, uh, just to go over, over this once again. So the, uh, the um, 
All of the sugars ultimately originate from the carbon dioxide. After, they, uh, after this carbon dioxide is fixed uh, in the autotrophs in a process called photosynthesis. So basically we can write down a very simple scheme like uh, uh, CO2 plus water and uh, using energy of light you will get the sugar and the oxygen is being released. So in the process of photosynthesis. Okay. Uh, Again, arbitrary, we can subdivide, I mean, all carbohydrates into, of course, I mean, there are lots of different classifications, and there are different ways how you can uh, sort of divide, I mean, sugars in different groups. One way to subdivide, I mean, the carbohydrates in different classes uh, would be to actually uh, uh, to subdivide them based on how many uh, elementary sugar units are there present. So, for example, there could be monosaccharides, oligosaccharides, or polysaccharides. As you can guess, monosaccharides contains one sugar unit, oligosaccharides few, which is obviously more than one, but <laughs> less than many. And again, definition of many, so not very uh, precise. So, uh, but we will see actually what the, what the key difference between oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. Polysaccharides is usually, um, I mean, polymers of uh, elementary sugar units with really unknown number of chains. Okay, so what are the physical properties? I mean, each of you probably, uh, well, maybe not everyone, but uh, many of you eat sugar every day, right? So, and, so we know how it looks like. So it's colorless, crystalline solid, uh, solids that are freely soluble in water and insoluble in polar uh, solvents. So and most of the different sugars that we will talk about, they look very much similar to each other. So it's like, usually it's powders. I mean, so they're not liquids or gases. Uh, uh, so monosaccharides, I mean, uh, because, I mean, they're single uh, uh, sugar units, I mean, they're linear, unbranched chain of carbons. And one of the carbons double bonded to oxygen, that is the one which is called carbonyl, car uh, carbonyl group or carbonyl carbon. So uh, nomenclature of sugars uh, can be based uh, on the uh, position of that carbonyl group in the chain of carbon atoms. So if it's a terminal, if it has terminal position, then it will be an aldehyde group and the corresponding sugar will be called aldose. So if uh, actually the uh, position of the carbonyl group is actually, um, uh, I mean, next to the terminal, so it's second from one of the ends, so then it will be, it will be a keto group and the corresponding sugar will be called a ketose. So I'll show you the formulas in just a couple of slides. So another nomenclature is based on how many carbon atoms are there in the, in the, uh, in the, in the molecule of sugar. So, um, of course, theoretically, in organic chemistry, there could be compounds with as many as you wish, right? But we uh, study the molecules which are found in biological systems in the course of the biochemistry. As a result, we're discussing only those which make sense in, in terms of biological systems. So in, uh, in living cells, I mean, there, uh, uh, the sugars can contain, uh, can contain three, four, five, or six carbon atoms. And corresponding, uh, corresponding classes would be called trioses, tetroses, pentoses, or hexoses. Um, as I said before, so the monosaccharides can be either aldehydes or ketones with the, uh, with the two or more hydroxyl groups. So the, uh, the aldose will contain an aldehyde group I mean, so in this case, the carbonyl carbon will be at the terminal position, so which is usually referred as position one. And uh, because uh, we uh, number the carbon atoms based on the highest uh, oxidation state, because uh, aldehyde is a more oxidized uh, version of the carbon than the, uh, let's say, this alcohol uh, carbons. So then uh, this one will be numbered one. So in a, co in a case of... Um, a simplest ketose, there would, be, uh, there would be a keto group in the middle of the molecule in this case. Uh, but in all of the sugars, I mean, that we see in the biological systems, the keto group is next to the, is actually one carbon away from one of the ends. So, again, these are the simplest sugars that do exist in the, in the living cells. One is called glyceraldehyde, and the other one is dehydroxyacetone. Actually, remember these molecules, they are not so much important for this module, but they will be actually very important for the next module when you will be studying uh, glycolysis. So, because these two guys, I mean, so they actually play the pivotal role in the, in the, in the glycolysis uh, pathway. So they're right at the, in the center of that pathway.
Okay. Um, monosaccharides or simple sugars. Uh, so hexoses, I mean, or the sugars which contain six carbon atoms are the most common monosaccharides in nature. So um, probably, I mean, one of the most famous would be glucose. So we can, I will explain in a second why we call it D-glucose, but uh, because, I mean, it actually has an aldehyde group, as you can see from this formula, and it has six carbons, I mean, it can be called aldohexose which refers to the position, uh, basically, of the carbonyl group, right, and the number of carbon atoms in the main chain of that sugar. Um, so on the other hand, for example, the fructose, so it's a ketose, so it's a ketohexose, so it still has six carbons, Oops. so it has six carbons, but the carbonyl group, it's not uh, in the terminal position, it's uh, in the second position. So. So also, there are sugars such as ribose. I mean, so this is aldopintose. So it has, uh, it has the aldehyde group in the terminal position and five carbon atoms. Okay. Um, um, now we need to talk about enantiomers. So, uh, so, I mean, this term shouldn't be new, especially to those who have taken the organic chemistry course. So the all monosaccharides, except for dehydroxyacetone, contain at least one asymmetric, also called chiral, uh, carbon atom uh, that occur in optically active isomeric forms. So these forms are called enantiomers. So we can depict them as this uh, in, the, in, in, in the following formula. So you actually may say, like, um, uh, that, I mean, every, I mean uh, the molecule on the left and the molecule on the right are exactly the same. So formula-wise, yes, uh, but we haven't uh, we haven't taken into account the fact that the carbon that is in the center here, that it's tetrahedral carbon, so it's not flat, right? So as a result, uh, these two molecules, I mean, if we will have them in 3D, if we will we'll make a models of these uh, sugars and try to superimpose them, it won't be possible. So once again, in antiomers, I mean, are isomers that are not superimposable mirror images of each other. So I think, I mean, this uh, slide will uh, best of all reflector. So, um, so in antiomers, basically, it's the two molecules, I mean, when, when one of them is looking on itself in the mirror. So just do like an imaginary sort of exercise. Take this molecule from the mirror and try to superimpose it with the one which is, let's say, in real space. So yes, okay, you will, you will match the central carbon atom, right? You will also match the aldehyde and the, uh, and the alcohol group, right? with each other, but the hydroxyl and the proton will not match. They will be in the opposite locations. Again, so this, this is what is called enantiomers. So enantiomers are basically two molecules which have exactly the same physical, uh, well, some of the uh, physical chemical properties are the same. Uh, what is different mainly is optical properties. I mean, so one will rotate the, uh, uh, the light, uh, the, the plane of the polarized light in one direction, the other one is in the other direction. That's why they're also called D or L isomers. Uh, so all sugars have at least one chiral center except for the dehydroxyacetone. So see, dehydroxyacetone doesn't have any, uh, any, any, any chiral centers. Do you actually know from, or do you remember from the organic chemistry, how do you recognize uh, which uh, chiral center is, is, is actually, uh, how do you recognize them in the presence of the chiral centers in a given organic molecule? Exactly, exactly. So that's the key thing. So if you have four different substituents, then it's, a, it's definitely chiral carbon. So here, you can immediately disqualify it from being chiral just because it has double bond to oxygen, right? So, but also, let's, let's say that uh, there would be not an oxygen, but uh, let's say OH one side and H into the other, right? So the reason why that molecule will still not be chiral is because the top and the bottom will be the same. So, so you actually consider not just the nearest atom, right, but the entire thing on each side of the particular carbon that you're considering. Okay, how do we draw stereoisomers of monosaccharides? Uh, so in organic chemistry, so the chiral compounds are usually depicted as perspective formulas. Again, in this perspective formulas, I mean, the wedges are used. So the solid wedges are the, uh, basically point to the groups which are protruding from the, uh, I mean, towards the viewer. And the dashed wedges are the ones which protrude away from the viewer. 
So that will give that uh, this representation gives like a 3D perception of the molecule. Um, uh, however, in the case of uh, in the case of sugars or carbohydrates, uh, so uh, um, a different uh, I mean a, a simpler uh, 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 representation is actually being used. It's called Fisher projections. So uh, they uh, visually look very much similar. I mean, so Fisher projections are shown on the right here. So the, and you can see that they look very much similar to the molecule shown on the left. So the only assumption that we need to make is that the uh, horizontal bonds are the ones which look towards you, and the vertical ones are the ones which look away from you. So that's the only uh, assumption that you need to keep in mind. So, so that essentially, so if you have a Fisher projection formula of a sugar, it can be easily converted into this perspective formula and back. Okay. Um, uh, so speaking about enantiomers, a molecule with an N chiral centers will have two to the N stereoisomers. So aldohexoses have four chiral centers and therefore 16 possible stereoisomers. Let's, actually I think I have it on the subsequent slide here. Let's go back. Open any glucose molecule that we have. See why we have, okay, this one is not, is this a chiral center or not? No, okay, so this is, we, we do not count this one. Okay, is this one chiral? Yes, one. This one, two. This one, three. This one, four. And this one, no. Why not? Two hydrogens, exactly. So we have this, basically it's like, all, all, you can almost take it as a good rule of thumb. I mean, so that these are the carbons which are in the middle, excluding the double, uh, the, the one which is like a carbonyl carbon. So, so we have four chiral centers, which means that the total number of stereoisomers would be two to the power of four, which is 16. So, and we will see them in a second. Okay, so in sugars that contain many chiral centers, so only the one that is most distant from the carbonyl carbon is designated as D or L isomer. So that is also called a reference carbon. So uh, again, in the case of glyceraldehyde, I mean, it's kind of boring, so that's the only chiral center that it has. So and, uh, but in the sugars with more carbons, so that terminal portion of the, the configuration at the carbon at this terminal portion of the sugar is the one which defines the sugar as a D or L. So in other words, if this, I mean, here I'm showing you arabinose, but it doesn't really matter, just an example. So in order to call a sugar a D or L isomer, you just need to compare the configuration of this terminal uh, uh, terminal portion of the sugar, right, with a D glyceraldehyde. If it's the same, then it's a D sugar. So if it's the same as L glyceraldehyde, then it's an L isomer of sugar. So, so this special nomenclature again, D or L, pertains only to that terminal uh, fraction of the sugar. So, so D and L isomers of sugar are enantiomers. So, because, I mean, they, almost, they actually mirror reflections of each other. So, and uh, uh, what I would like you to remember, and that's why I actually put it in red here, is that most hexoses in living organisms are D-stereoisomers. So, uh, you, you actually already studied it with Professor Jeffrey, so that the amino acids which make up all the proteins, uh, uh, that which isomers are those? Huh? L, yes. So... Again, L or D, that initially, I mean, so stands for the direction. This is optical, pro this reg that's, that's related to the optical properties of the solution of the particular chemical compound. Uh, uh, for uh, whatever reason, Mother Nature chosen to use L isomers of amino acids, but D isomers of sugar. So, and some, uh, some few sugars actually occur in the L form. Uh, which, which is actually this l arabinose but very rarely. Okay, uh, so now we add in actually one extra level of complexity. So what are diastereomers? So, so uh, diastereomers, I mean, are stereoisomers that are not mirror images of each other. For example, look at these two, uh, two sugars, uh, erythrose and thriose, right? I mean, formula-wise, again, they're all the same. So, but the position of this... Uh, uh, but the position of this OH 
I mean, uh, the way it should look on the right in the case of erythros, but in the case of free was one looks, the top one looks to the left and the bottom one looks to the right. So, uh, again, uh, don't forget that these horizontal lines are the ones towards you and the vertical lines are the ones away from you. So if you will assemble it like in a model, I mean, actually, I mean, for those who are really interested, I mean, uh, in organic chemistry, I mean, just buy on Amazon. It's like, I don't think it costs much, maybe 10 bucks or something, like a little sort of uh, kit for making the molecules. So that may actually help, I mean, with the, uh, you probably don't need it for this particular model of this course, I'm just in general. So it's kind of fun to, to see how, how uh, what are these um, uh, stereoisomers of sugars. Uh, yeah, in any case, so uh, if you will make a models of these two sugars, there is no way you can superimpose them, so which means that they're actually different. And the dif uh, different configuration of chiral centers, uh, other than the uh, then reference carbon atom. So basically, we are not talking about that portion of the molecule, right? So we're talking about all of the OHs, which are other than uh, that uh, terminal portion, I mean, the bottom portion of any sugar. So depending on whether they look to the left or to the right, so this would be different isomers, which are called diastereomers. So these diastereomers, they have different physical properties, such as water solubility and, uh, and so on. Okay, um, now another type of mers that we're gonna study, epimers. So epimers are monosaccharides that differ only in their configuration around one particular carbon. For example, in the middle I'm showing you uh, uh, a glucose. Uh, so one of the most abundant sugars in all living organisms. So, uh, and uh, so the epimer would be a sugar uh, which will have actually only one carbon swapped. For example, mannose, it's a C2 epimer of glucose. So, which means that the position of the OH at the uh, second carbon is just, I mean, it's looking opposite to the opposite side. So the same holds true for the galactose, I mean, which is a C4 epimer of glucose. Of course, you can say the opposite way. So you can call a glucose a C, what would be, C3 epimer of galact. Yeah, actually, no. C, so the glucose would be C4 epimer of galactose, I mean, the same way. So the same as with the mannose. Glucose would be C2 epimer of mannose. Uh, uh, so, again, what's the difference between diastereomers and epimers? So. Uh, epimers would be a subversion of the diastereomers when we talk only about one particular difference at one particular carbon atoms. So basically all epimers are by default diastereomers. But it's not that all diastereomers are epimers, Necess not necessarily. Uh, because actually you may have, let's say, one sugar with three OHs looking to one side and the other sugar will be with three OHs looking to the other side. These two sugars will be, by definition, diastereomers, but not epimers, because they have more than one carbon difference. Okay, so now we will just quickly go, I mean, again, this was in the textbook. Uh, uh, this is just the uh, formulas of the sugars. And I will, uh, like, have a separate slide with the list of those which I'm expecting you to know. So, again, we start with the simplest sugars, I mean, with three carbons. So, glyceraldehyde. So... And the four carbons, I mean, there is uh, only two sugars, the erythros and freos. As you will notice, so the more, let's say, with the, with the five carbons, there would be four sugars. So the number of possible sugars increases geometrically as you increase the number of carbons. Okay, so with the five carbons, I mean, there is ribose, arabinose, xylose, and uh, lixose. So the one which actually has... Uh, uh, lots of importance for our subsequent lecture is the ribose because this is a sugar uh, which, uh, which makes, uh, which is a part of the nucleic acid such as DNA and RNA as we will see. Okay, so we now we get to the six carbon sugars where, and there are eight of them. So uh, the most important ones are glucose, mannose and galactose. So again, as you can see, the only difference between all these sugars is different combinations of where the OHs, uh, whether the hydroxyls look to the left or to the right. But uh, keep, uh, I mean, basically pay attention to the fact that the bottom portion, right, because we are talking about only D isomers, like D allos, D altros, D glucose, or D manos. So the, uh, the bottom ones, right, so the bottom section, are always the same because they need to be the same as in the D-glyceraldehyde. 
Okay. Uh, so now uh, ketosis. So uh, dehydroxyacetone, I mean, it doesn't have any stereoisomer, so it's not, it doesn't have any DOL uh, in the prefix. However, starting from the four carbon uh, ketosis, I mean, so we already have DOL prefix. So uh, again, with the five carbons, I mean, there is uh, D-ribulose or D-xylulose, and one of the most important actually is the D-fructose from the six carbon uh, ketosis. So um, ribulose, actually, it's, a, uh, it's not a very abundant sugar in plants, but it's the one which actually is very important for the, one of the main functions of the green plants, the photosynthesis. Uh, so the carbon dioxide, when it's been fixed from the atmosphere, is first attached actually to that sugar. So and as a result, basically, we will get uh, 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 the, the immediate product of photosynthesis or CO2 fixation would be... Um, uh, uh, would be a, a, a hexose. So, and the basically the most abundant enzyme. So, in terms of the mass and the number of molecules in this world, it's the enzyme in plants called ribulose bis phosphate carboxylase. So, that's an enzyme which basically attaches the CO2 molecules to molecule to this to this sugar in plants. Here is the list. Oh, sorry, you had a question. Okay, so. To know, glyceraldehyde, dehydroxyacetone, these are simple. So ribose, so glucose, uh, just because it's one of the main sugars. So then mannose and galactose. Again, it's relatively easy to, I mean, all what you need to remember is the glucose formula, right? Because if you remember that mannose is a C2 epimer of glucose, then you can easily, right, so swap one hydroxyl group at one carbon and draw the molecule of mannose. So, and the same, the same is with galactose, I mean, which is a C4 epimer of glucose. So the only, uh, the only uh, uh, um, sugar from the ketose family, so I would like you to remember, is a fructose. So, okay. So now we get into, like, uh, uh, to, some chem uh, to some chemical, uh, to talk about some chemical properties of the, uh, of the sugars. Um, so sugars, actually, as you probably noticed, contain very, uh, re I mean, uh, very reactive groups. If they would be by themselves, not in the in the same molecule, they would have reacted already many times, such as aldehyde group or alcohol group, for example. So, uh, and 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 the aldehyde or ketone groups, as we know, they're electrophilic. So, in other words, I mean, they like to attract some uh, atoms, uh, which has an extra electron or like an uh, additional electronegativity on them. So, and. Uh, such as alcohol oxygen, for example, which has two lone pairs of electrons, which would be a perfect nucleophile. So in any case, so what happens is the aldehyde, uh, I mean, this is, a, uh, this is a general scheme of the reaction in solution. What will happen between aldehyde and alcohol? So the result of such reaction will be called hemiacetal, and then when the second round of reaction will take place, it will be acetal. So the same is with the ketone. It will be hemiketal and ketal. But again, this is when we talk about two separate molecules in solution. So, but we know that the sugar molecules, they contain both the aldehyde and uh, aldehyde or ketone and alcohol. So what will stop them from actually reacting? So let me just ask you uh, a question. For example, uh, glyceraldehyde, right? So we have this, uh, we have this, uh, aldehyde group, which is a very reactive group, and we have OH here and OH here. Why, why they do not react with each other? It's, uh, I mean, the resulting cycle would be, would be uh, like a triangle. So it's, uh, even if it will try to cyclize, I mean, through the, I mean, through the longest possible cycle, it will be actually uh, I mean, there would be lots of torsion. I mean, so this is a thermodynamically unfavorable reaction. However, when we talk about, let's say, huh? No, no, this is, I mean, we're talking about, let's say, as a chemical, let's say, in a test tube. So uh, whether it's theoretically possible or not, it's possible. I mean, but I mean, the resulting molecule would be, I mean, there would be too much, uh, uh, basically, torsion, uh, um, stress in it. So, but when we actually get into the five carbon atoms, or even six carbon atoms, right, 
So this aldehyde group actually can form a perfect six-membered cycle. So the six-membered cycles are the most stable in nature. And that's indeed what happens. So I'm actually getting to my next slide. Okay. So the aldehyde group and the and this uh, and this of course I mean the aldehyde group can theoretically react with any of the OHs on the molecule. But because I mean the most stable are the six membered cycles, not even five membered cycles. So this is the most sort of preferable or the most uh, probable way of uh, of cyclization. So um, and, 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 and actually, I think, I mean, uh, in the textbook, I mean, they showed it very nicely. So first, I mean, you start with this uh, glucose molecule, right? And then you kind of uh, uh, put it on the side and make it as a cycle, but still as the same molecule. And here, you see this lone pair of electron on the OH, right? Which nucleophilically attacks the carbonyl carbon, the aldehyde group. And as a result, you can have two different types of, I mean, basically two different isomers of the same sugar. So depending on where the resulting OH will go. So if the resulting OH will go on the opposite side from this uh, terminal uh, CH2OH of the sugar, then this one will be alpha isomer. Uh, and if it goes on the same side, it, it will be called beta. So basically this carbon, which was not a chiral center in the linear sugar, becomes a chiral now. So when and the total number of isomers for any given sugar is actually doubled. So, so besides having DOL, so there is also alpha or beta versions. I mean, especially for the five and six carbon sugars. So this carbon is called anomeric carbon. So the one which is actually was a, uh, for the, depending on whether it's the aldose or ketose, the anomeric carbons would be in different positions. Let me just ask you straight. Okay, so talking about the ketoses, which will be the anomeric carbon here? The former keto group, right? So in the, in the case of ketoses, the second position is usually the, uh, actually always, the, uh, and would be the anomeric carbon. So in the case of aldoses, it would be always the first position, the anomeric carbon. So it's where the aldehyde or keto group was placed. So that's the carbon which turns into this additional chiral center. Uh, so what are the what are the names? So six-membered oxygen-containing rings are called pyranoses uh, because of their similarity to the organic molecule called pyran. So you see, this is the uh, the molecule with the oxygen in this. Uh, it's like a heterocycle, basically. And and because of the similarity, uh, the ring forms of the sugars, like of the glucose, are called pyranoses. So. Uh, to be absolutely literate, like for example, this formula of glucose can be called alpha D glucopyranose. So it's like to emphasize, I mean, this is not just a glucose, but a glucose in a ring form. So with the uh, alpha means that the oxygen at the anomeric carbon is look, looking opposite side, I mean, then the CH2OH. Okay, so in the same, the same is true for the five-membered uh, sugar, for the five-carbon sugars. Okay, so this takes us to the, uh, uh, to the special representation, which we already introduced here, so implicitly, right? Uh, but this way of showing sugars is actually more common. Uh -huh. well, well, actually, I, I will, I mean, can I just go a couple slides? I mean, because we're, we're, this concept, I will reiterate it once again. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, it's very important. Okay, so... Okay, this takes us to this, new, uh, to this type of representation of sugars, which is called Howard's perspective formula. So uh, perhaps, I mean, so if you open any textbook on biochemistry, so this is how the sugars will be depicted, not like this, but mainly like, uh, like this uh, he, uh, hexagons. So how to get from, the, uh, from this linear Fisher projection to this form? So. Uh, well, here is a set of instructions, but to make long story short, you kind of tilt it 90 degrees, I mean this linear, I mean or Fisher projection, tilt it 90 degrees, so let it fall to the right, so, and then basically if, it's a, if, it, if it was a D form, then the CH2H goes on top, if it was an L form, it goes on the bottom. So every OH that after that tilting was looking down, will keep looking down, and the one, every one which was looking up, we'll keep looking up. So see, uh, follow the numbering here, right? So after you sort of tilted at 90 degrees and then cyclized, 
So like in this form. So the only one which was initially looking to the left was the oxygen, OH at the carbon free. So after you tilt it, that would be the only one looking up. And indeed, so here we have only one looking up. So and when you cyclize, I mean, again, it can be alpha or beta. So with the same probability. So uh, why we even talking about this uh, cyclization of sugars? Uh, we're talking about this because in solution, so there is actually no linear form or like less than a percent it's represented by a linear form of sugar. So in an aqueous solution, if we take a glucose like a powder and dissolve it in water, there will be less than a percent of this linear form, right? So 99% would be either alpha or beta. Actually, beta comprises 65% and alpha comprises 33%. Um, again, to answer your question about the, uh, about the anomeric carbon. So, so the carbon, that was the aldehyde or the ketone. In this case, I mean, uh, let's, let's talk about this example. Again, it's a glucose, right? So the one which was uh, carrying the aldehyde group, okay. So because it's a reactive uh, species, it can easily react with uh, many alcohol groups that are also present in the same sugar. So, and what happens, I mean, so the OH serves as a nuclear, uh, as a basically, uh, as a nucleophile. So because it has lone, two actually lone pairs of electrons. So it kind of attacks the same reaction, very similar nucleophilic attack reaction as we already uh, started to remember the chymotrypsin mechanism, for example, very similar thing. So uh, this OH basically attacks onto this carbonyl carbon. As a result, this carbonyl becomes tetrahedral. So it becomes three-dimensional. I mean, the consequence of uh, being three-dimensional is that it will start to have uh, uh, optical isomers. So depending on which side, I mean, the substituents will look. So, and it can actually uh, cyclize in such a way that one OH can look down or it can cyclize so that the OH will look up. Again, uh, it's very important for me to point you to this uh, actually arrows here. So this is reversible. So, so basically in solution, uh, even let's say if you hypothetically will purify glucose in the alpha form, right, will have a powder of it and then dissolve it in water, immediately it will redistribute to all these uh, different forms. So this is how this molecule will exist in, molecules will exist in solution. So they almost do not exist in the linear form and predominantly exist in the cyclized form. And uh, so this uh, cyclic forms are the one which is most physiologically uh, uh, sort of relevant are the ones which, uh, uh, I mean, show how the molecule actually looks in, uh, in, in the, uh, inside the cell. Okay. Um, Another important aspect about the sugars is uh, its uh, ability or inability to, uh, to reduce uh, uh, actually other chemicals. So the monosaccharides can be, well, all monosaccharides are reducing agents. Okay, let's see why. So what does the reducing mean? Reducing means, in chemistry in general, reducing means ability to give electrons, right? So, and as something, some compound reduces something else, it being, it's being oxidized in turn. So, um, so the ring forms of nanosaccharides exist in equilibrium with their open chain forms. We already talked about this here, right? So that, uh, so that the, uh, the, the open form, although it's uh, actually negligible in solution, it still exists. So, so the, uh, this uh, linear form, right? It's the only one which has an aldehyde. So. And the aldehyde is a group which can actually uh, be a good uh, reducer. So, for example, it can reduce uh, copper ions from copper 2 plus to copper plus. So, or argentum from argentum plus to uh, basically like a pure silver. So, and, uh, uh, and basically uh, uh, because of this, I mean, these reagents can be easily uh, tested whether they exist in the linear form or not. And, uh, and that's what's called ability or inability to reduce. So, um, uh, so the carbohydrates without a free hemiacetal or hemiketal will be, uh, uh, I mean, will not be, I mean, will not be able to reduce anything. So any monosaccharide, regardless, I mean, of whether it in the, uh, at a the given time point is in a cyclic form or not, 
because it can always, again, we remember this, it's an equilibrium, right? It can always go back into the linear form. So it can, re it can be uh, used as a, or it can, uh, uh, it can be reducing. So we will see in a few slides when we'll start talking about polysaccharides, why is it important? So it's just a simple test, uh, 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 basically, uh, to see whether the uh, sugars have reducing ends or not. Okay. Um, very quickly, just go over the uh, variety of uh, hexose derivatives. So as I said, I mean, some sugars can have, besides this, carbon, hydrogens, and oxygen can also have nitrogen and phosphates. So the most common uh, derivative of, for example, glucose can be, N, uh, it can be glucose amine. So you can see that the only difference from glucose is that instead of OH, there is an NH2 group. And, I mean, there is another derivative of that derivative, which is called N-acetyl uh, beta D glucose amine. So, uh, so this, uh, this molecule is actually the uh, basis for the, uh, when it's polymerized, I mean, that's an exoskeleton of arthropods, makes exoskeleton of arthropods. Um, also, there could be phosphate groups attached to the sugars. And uh, this is mainly for their metabolism. As you will study in the next module when talking about uh, mainly about the glycolysis, so you will see that in order for the glucose to be burned in the cell or to be used as a source of fuel, so the phosphate groups need to be attached to the, to the glucose molecule first. Okay. All right. So before we get to the polysaccharides, we need to actually very quickly go over the disaccharides. I think it's, I mean, the name says it all. So the disaccharides are just, I mean, the uh, basically uh, uh, conjugates between two uh, simple sugars. So, so they consist of two monosaccharides which join together by an O-glycosidic bond. So, so glycosidic bond forms when anomeric carbon of one monosaccharide reacts with the carbon carrying hydroxyl group from the second monosaccharide. So, and uh, glycosidic bond and acetyl between monomers is less reactive than the hemiacetyl at the second monomer. So let's just take a look on some examples. So again, here we have two glucoses, right? So on the left we have alpha D glucose, on the, on the, I'm sorry, on the left we have alpha D glucose, on the right we have beta D glucose. Okay, so if we'll make a disaccharide out of these monosaccharides, so we will have uh, a chemical compound called maltose. Basically, this is just a disaccharide made of two glucoses, and they're connected by alpha 1, 4 glycosidic bond. So this bond, which is now an acetal, so that's a bond which is called a glycosidic bond. And the connectivity here, so it's alpha 1, 4. So, so we say we add this uh, prefix alpha only to the first sugar because that's the one which uses its anomeric carbon uh, in formation basically of this disaccharide. We know that glucose itself it's a reducing sugar, right? So which means that it can open up. So treat this ability to reduce or not. I don't know. I have a very strange analogy. It's like ability of the snake to bite its own tail, right? So and. In order to, I mean, basically the sugar, when it cyclizes, it's like the snake biting its own tail. In order to reduce, to be able to reduce, that tail needs to be, let's say the, the I mean, uh, the snake needs to be un, sort of uncycled, I mean, open up. So, okay, so if we, okay, made a disaccharide out of these two monosaccharides, uh, would this disaccharide be reducing or not? So let's just analyze it first. Okay, would this one be possible to open up, the first sugar? No, because once it's involved in the acetyl formation, it's done. It's cyclized kind of permanently, like basically take it for granted. But what about this one? Yes. So in basically you can have a long, long chain of this monosaccharides attached the same way, but the terminal one, which will still be able to open up, right? So will be the one which will reduce. And as a result, the whole, the whole monosaccharide or oligosaccharide or polysaccharide will be reducing. Um, here I'm actually showing you, uh, well, this is lactose, but uh, let's look at the sucrose. So this is a, would this one be actually reducing or not? It won't be reducing 
for the exact same reason because here we have uh, two I mean two sugars connected to each other via their anomeric carbons. So basically, neither this glucose nor this fructose molecule will be open to, will be able to open up as a result, uh, let's say of I mean basically they as a result of disaccharide formation. So um, having uh, ability basically uh, retaining the ability of a sugar to open and close or to expose its aldehyde group or not. Uh, it's a feature that uh, you not necessarily need to have, depending on what is the purpose of the sugar. For example, what is the sucrose? Is I mean, uh, what is the purpose for sucrose in plants? Right. So this is a storage di uh, disaccharide. So this is where the plant basically temporarily stores energy from photosynthesis. So the plant doesn't want that sugar to be any reactive at all. So as a result, you need to make it as inert as possible so that it won't have any, any active uh, chemical groups such as aldehyde group. So and what, the, what Mother Nature is doing is just connecting two of the most reactive atoms of the two monosaccharides, right? Make a disaccharide which is relatively inert. The same holds true, for example, for this uh, interesting uh, disaccharide which is called 3 halose which is again two, which is a polymer alpha-1, alpha-1 of glucose. So this uh, sugar is used as an antifreeze in the hemolymph of some insects which live, uh, which, which basically live in very cold waters like below the freezing point. So, or some, uh, some of the, uh, I think, uh, invertebrates living at this temperature. So th this is basically used as, a, as an antifreeze in the blood. Obviously this chemi I mean something that is used as an antifreeze doesn't need to be reactive at all. Its function is to do something else. And uh, so as a result, I mean, this, this sugar is inert. Uh, okay, so, I mean, the bottom line is simple. So if the, uh, if the purpose of the sugar is stored just to store energy, then the mother nature usually gets, uh, I mean, tries to get rid of this, uh, I mean, chains that can open and close. I mean, the less reactive groups, the better. So, but for some other sugars, like maltose, for example, in the, uh, which participates in metabolism. So uh, you actually, uh, you do need, uh, uh, you do need some, I mean, ability to react with some compounds in the cell. Okay, here are the three disaccharides that I would like you to remember. Sucrose, lactose, maltose. So maltose, I mean, basically two glucoses. Lactose, it's the polymer of galactose and glucose. And, uh, uh, and sucrose, oh, sorry, there we go, here. So and sucrose is the just a regular table sugar, so it's good to know the formula. Um, all right, let's uh, let's now talk about the polysaccharides. Uh, so uh, as it's clear from the name, so polysaccharides are just I mean multiple, just like proteins and amino acids, right? So it's just polymers of uh, simple sugars. So it's a natural carbohydrates that are uh, found as polymers. So the polysaccharides can be homo or heteropolysaccharides depending on, uh, depending on what sugar units they're made of. If they're made of the same sugar units, then obviously they would be homopolysaccharides. If of the different, then heteropolysaccharides. Um, the proteins would be obviously heteropolymers, right? Because I mean the amino acids that they're made of are always, all di I mean, are always different. So it's not that there is a protein which is made just out of phenylalanine. So they're usually made of a particular sequence of amino acids. Okay, uh, so the polysaccharides can be linear or branched. So this uh, just means whether it's one chain, as we will see, or it's like has some uh, branching points. Uh, so in the function-wise, I mean, they can be subdivided into storage. Uh, uh, in, uh, polysaccharides used for storage and polysaccharides used for structure. So. Uh, so polysaccharides, unlike proteins, for example, or nucleic acids, do not have defined molecular weight. So, so this is in contrast here to these uh, molecules, and uh, uh, there is no template is used for polysaccharides. As we know, for nucleic acids, I mean, there is always a template, and for, um, uh, for proteins. So proteins are made using the template of RNA. So, okay. Um, perhaps one of the most famous examples of the polysaccharide would be the starch. So I don't know, have you ever seen or encountered starch in your life? Where? Huh? Uh, 
Yes, kind of, yeah, exactly. A lar largely what we eat in bread is starch. So potatoes, for example, uh, well, you can buy starch in any store. It's sold like as a white powder. So basically flour that we eat, it's uh, largely starch. Okay, so, uh, so starch is the main polysaccharide in plants. So, and uh, it's a mixture of two homopolysaccharides of glucose. One is called amylose and the other is amylopectin. So basically amylose is... Uh, it's just a continuous repetition of the glucose units, so uh, which are connected via alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. So remember amylose as a disaccharide, right? So the amylose is just continuation, continuing adding the glucose molecule the same, the same way. Um, so amylopectin is more interesting because it has branching points. So, uh, so basically, I think this scheme would actually explain what the branching is, so, so that we have uh, uh, we have uh, basically amylose fibers and we have amylopectin. So an amylopectin are the ones which can branch. At, I mean, okay, uh, so uh, an animal version of the plant starch would be called glycogen. So glycogen is usually stored in muscles and liver. So, and, uh, so glycogen is a branched uh, homopolysaccharide of glucose. Basically, Glycogen is almost the same as starch. The only thing, uh, actually, it would be more correct to com uh, compare it with amylopectin. So, so basically, glycogen is like an uh, animal version of amylopectin whose branching occurs more frequently. So if uh, uh, basically branching in uh, amylopectin occurs every 25 to 30 residues, then in, um, uh, in, in the glycogen it occurs uh, every... 8 to 10 to 12 residues. So it's like three times more branched, basically. So, okay. Uh, so these are the main storage uh, forms of uh, 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 polysaccharides. So, so the um, uh, glycogen and starch often uh, form granules in the cells, so which are made not only of the polysaccharide itself, but also uh, from the enzymes that metabolize them. Uh, so, and, and you will actually start the next module from studying those enzymes and pathways which metabolize glycogen and starch. Um, uh, uh, so glycogen and amylopectin have one reducing end, but many non-reducing ends. As you can actually see from this diagram, right? So this end would be the only one which will have this opened, uh, actually, well, which, which will have that glucose unit which can easily open and close. Okay. Um, so dextrans are bacterial and yeast polysaccharides. So, uh, so they also uh, branched homopolysaccharides of glucose uh, whose monomers are connected uh, basically via alpha-1,6 uh, connections. So this is the most abundant type of connection, right? And they're branched at alpha-1,3. I intentionally included that slide for those of you who will decide to become dentists because this is like the... Uh, uh, pain in the neck, uh, part of the dental work, because the plague that accumulates in our teeth from the bacteria uh, living in our uh, mouth, actually, it's largely this dextrans. So, and this is the, uh, actually, when you, count, when you come for teeth cleaning, actually, usually, that's what takes probably longest time to get rid of this dextran deposited all over the teeth. Okay. Uh, structural forms of polysaccharides. So, uh, one of the, as I said, one of the most abundant is the cellulose. So this is the most abundant polymer on our planet. So cellulose, it's a fibrous, tough, water-insoluble substance. So it's found mainly in the plant cell walls, and it's like the typical materials, it's wood and cotton. Uh, so what's interesting is cellulose is a linear homopolymer of glucose. It was always amazing to me that the, actually the difference between starch and uh, cellulose is very negligible. So it's only what kind of glycosidic bond is used to connect the individual glucose units. In the case of starch, it's uh, alpha-1,4, and in the case of uh, cellulose, it's beta-1,4, right? And this difference, which seems, I mean, very kind of non-important, uh, is transferred into such a huge difference in their physical chemical properties. We know that the cellulose is very tough material, right? It's hard to sort of like rupture it or something or like we, everybody like should imagine like piece of food, for example, when, when talking about cellulose. And uh, this is largely due to the uh, 
uh, ability to form these hydrogen bonds between the, between the individual glucose uh, units. As a result, I mean, all of them align into this sort of long fibers, so which, which are very tough to break, so which is not uh, the case with the starch, obviously, because over there, so they alternate. Uh, uh, so the uh, cellulose is a type of polymer that uh, cannot be easily metabolized. So as we know, starch, I mean, so can be easily metabolized, right? So the bread that we eat, I mean, the potatoes that we eat, all the starchy products that we consume, so they, I mean, this starch can be easily uh, metabolized in the form of sugars uh, uh, in, in, in our body. But the cellulose cannot be metabolized. So it's only some fungi, bacteria, and some protozoans can secrete an enzyme called cellulase, uh, which, uh, which can basically uh, uh, hydrolyze the cellulose and as a result yield the single glucose units. So, uh, and, and most animals cannot use cellulose as a fuel source because they lack this, uh, 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 the enzyme to do it. However, ruminants like cows and sheep, they have, uh, and also termites, so they have symbionts that produce this enzyme and as a result uh, uh, they can digest the cellulose and use it as a source of fuel. So that's why uh, termites are so bad for the houses, I mean, especially if the houses are largely built of the uh, wood. So like uh, all these, I mean, structural elements of the houses are made of wood, the termites, which can digest that wood, so they essentially kind of dissolve it. So, um, okay. Um, yeah, so the agar and agaros, I mean, are interesting poly, uh, oh, actually, before we talk about agar, so chitin. So chitin is a, uh, it's also a homopolymer of N-acetylglucosamine, so which are also connected by beta-1,4 uh, glycosidic bonds. So uh, just to make it easy to remember, so the chitin is the same as cellulose, except for that it's not the glucose that is uh, used to build it, but the N-acetylglucosamine uh, derivative. So. So agar and agaros, I mean, basically just for your, I mean, I'm showing this only for your reference. I'm not expecting you to remember this. But uh, you all know like the jellos, right? So, so these are the polysaccharides which come from algae. And uh, everyone probably saw it in the grocery stores like the uh, substance called agar. So basically that's the, these polysaccharides from, uh, from uh, uh, which were isolated from algae. And uh, it's usually used uh, to like make different uh, jealous, jealous products. So uh, we have just to very quickly go over the, uh, I mean, a few more different uh, conjugates of sugars. Um, one is called glycosamine glycans. So these are heteropolysaccharides of the extracellular matrix in animals. So they are linear polymers of repeating disaccharides units. So there is only, uh, usually one monomer is either N-acetylglucosamine or galactosamine and the other is either the uronic acid, so which is also just a, an, uh, a sugar which is oxidized at its sixth position, or a sulfate ester of a sugar. So uh, this molecule have extended hydrate, uh, basically uh, this such molecules have lots of capabilities for forming hydrogen bonds with water, and as a result they attract lots of water, as you will see what their function is related to it. Uh, and they form meshwork with uh, fibrous protein to form extracellular ma uh, matrix. So they can serve as lubricants and, uh, and, join, and joints as a connective tissue as well, like, such as cartilages or tendons. So here are the most uh, popular ones. Uh, for example, uh, hyaluronate. So this is part of the uh, uh, cartilage. So, so you have repeating unit of uh, uh, glucose uronic acid, so you see that in this position six there is carboxyl group and uh, N-acetyl glucosamine. So, so this, uh, this is a disaccharide unit which is repeated many times making a linear molecule. Uh, so another one would be uh, chondroitin sulfate. So this is also a very similar molecule except for that it has uh, sulfate esters on the sugar. Okay. Um, Perhaps, I mean, the, uh, like from the other slide, I mean, there is keratin sulfate, which is an important part of the skin. Uh, and interesting one is a heparin. So uh, 
for those of you who will become doctors, heparin, you will, you will, I think, learn it from day one, what is it used for as a blood thinning uh, kind of thing, uh, I mean, agent. Uh, so why does it do it? So it prevents blood clotting, basically. Uh, so it's uh, doing it because many of the factors of the blood clotting are uh, positively charged. And again, if we look again onto the uh, formula of this compound, you see how many, so there is carboxylic group here. There is sulfate, 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 another sulfate. So, so it's very, very negative. So basically, it is used as a buffer sort of which attracts all those uh, factors, I mean, blood clotting factors, not specifically, and they just kind of stick to heparin and cannot do what they're supposed to do. So as a result, the blood uh, is not, I mean, I mean at, at least it doesn't clot as fast as it would uh, without, uh, without this. Let's just very quickly review the uh, polysaccharides. Uh, so again, the starch, it's uh, uh, basically a uh, polymer of glucose, which is made of two different types of polymers. Amylose, which is just a linear uh, polymer of glucose, and amylopectin, which is uh, uh, a branched, uh, I mean, basically, version of the glucose polymer, which has alpha-1,4 uh, uh, main uh, connections and alpha-1,6 branching points. So glycogen, basically, is an animal version of amylopectin, uh, which has the only difference it has is just how frequently I mean, the uh, branching occurs. So cellulose and starch are kind of the same, except for the fact that the connect connection is through the beta-1,4 instead of the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. So chitin, which makes an exoskeleton of all arthropods, such as spiders, insects, uh, uh, crustaceans, and uh, myriapods, uh, so it's actually made of uh, beta-1,4 and acetyl glucosamine. So basically, chitin is the same as cellulose, except for the, uh, except for it's modified uh, uh, at the two, uh, two posi uh, position two of the, uh, actually, yeah, position two of the ring. So dextrans are uh, bacterial and yeast polysaccharides, and yeah, so this one's I mean, it's basically I would like you to remember mainly starch and glycogen. So, and uh, of course, I mean, you don't need to, I mean, if you know the formula of glucose, you can easily draw there let's say, formula of either starch or glycogen, but the pro I, mean, I, I, I mean, this is not the, this is not the point. So what, what is the point is that to know what are the uh, glycosidic, uh, what are the bonds between the individual elements of, uh, of these polymers. Okay, so yeah, we have a couple more slides to go. Uh, so there are uh, several, a uh, few more different glycoconjugates. Uh, so there are glycoproteins and protein glycans. So uh, the main difference between the two of them is just the per relative percentage of the uh, protein and the uh, 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 basically sugars attached. So, uh, so proteins with small oligosaccharides are called uh, glycoproteins. So basically it's just the sugars which are decorated with the several, I'm sorry, these are proteins which are decorated with the uh, sugar molecules. I'm sorry. Uh, in most cases, I mean, the sugars are O-linked or N-linked. And uh, so they, uh, they attach through, let's say, a serine or asparagine uh, uh, side chains, I mean, on the protein. So uh, what I would like you to remember, and we will talk about this in the subsequent lectures, is, is that these uh, glycoproteins exist on the cell membrane, on the plasma membrane. And they exist only in the outside portion of it. So. Um, so these, these are so-called, I mean, basically you can, uh, the, way, the way it's depicted in the slide, I mean, uh, so different proteins have uh, different combinations of these sugars, which uh, is used as sort of a barcoding in the, in the organism. This is how uh, one cell recognizes, I mean, the other types of cells. I mean, it's through these signatures on the surface of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the plasma membrane of the other cell. So sugars can be conjugated to the lipids. So... Uh, this is what we actually will talk about uh, in next lecture as well. So, and finally, there are proteoglycans. So, as I said, the only difference from glycoproteins is that proteoglycans uh, have, well, actually, there are several differences. The main one is that 
glycoproteins have only have a little bit of sugar and a lot of protein, right? And protoglycan is vice versa. So it's actually mainly the sugar or polysaccharide which is attached to a protein. And, uh, and, 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 and they've basically, uh, uh, I mean, serve an important function in the organizing the extracellular matrix around the cells. So the proteins are sort of used as an anchors to anchor this whole structure in the membrane. But then it is attached to the very long and branched uh, polysaccharides outside the cell. So, okay. So, and yeah, that's it for today. Uh, so I see that uh, our TAs came. So they will probably show you, as far as I understand, the uh, first uh, exam. Make sure to return it. So you have, actually, if there is any mistakes, any, uh, make sure that the counting was correct, right? So if there is any problem, so you disagree with the grading, uh, I mean, you can come to the office hours and just simply, uh, I mean, submit a grade request.